the design of the Unix terminal. Um, I'm Jesse Hathaway, I'm from Braintree. Um, so this is two parts. There's the Unix part, and then there's the terminal part. So I want to talk about both of them, um, and then how they come together and create this amazing system that we all use all the time. I think a lot of us take it for granted, um, and perhaps not all of us in this room share my uh, love for it. Um, all right, <clears throat> so the first part, second part in the uh, two-part word, but uh, two-part phrase, but uh, let's talk about the terminal history. Uh, so in 1963, there's a bunch of different ways to encode letters and numbers, and that creates uh, a lot of confusion when you're trying to exchange information. So they, they came up with the ASCII standard that we all know and love. Um, at the time, it's seven bits. You can only encode 128 different characters. Evidently, they thought there was going to be definitely enough. They left a huge section of it unassigned originally. But one um, person thought this was uh, a mis that maybe 128 is going to be insufficient. So this guy, Bob Bemmer, there's this great um, article, him talking about um, his rationale for the escape character. So you think, oh, that's sort of the escape character. I use this all the time. There's nothing special about it. Um, but he saw that. ASCII can only, is, is this new standard, how are we going to supplement all these existing standards? And the way that we're going to do that is we'll put this escape character in this, this actual character in the code, and that way we can escape out of the ASCII code and encode other information. So it's like this extens extensibility idea very early on in history. So here's like an iconic photo that we've all seen probably of Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Um, the interesting part is not these two people exactly, um, but it's this teletype model 33, which I know is what you were looking at in that picture. Um, so the teletype model 33 um, is notable for a lot of reasons. Um, one, it was very expensive, so it was like $700 at the time. Uh, it was built in Skokie, Illinois. The, when they sold the 500,000th one of them, they plated it in gold. I don't know who has that one. Um, but uh, so this thing is great. You, you type on it. You have some sort of point-to-point -point connection to something else, and whatever you type comes out on the other end, and vice versa. Um, so this is just an explosion of communication with this thing. Everyone's connecting point-to-point -point things. Uh, 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 policemen precincts have it on an entire loop, so whenever one, somebody types something in a precinct, it shows up in another precinct. Like Information is being exchanged all the time. And they're so inexpensive, the mini computers showing up, and so people start connecting them to their mini computers um, to start writing software. And uh, I did want to mention one other thing on uh, the, tele the teletype is that it's that beginning of you are using this keyboard and full language to talk to the computer, which is, a, which is incredible. Before you're flipping bits, flipping registers, punching things out on a punch card. Um, then the DEC VT05 comes, comes along. Um, this is like the first real terminal from uh, DEC. I don't know what happened to uh, one through four, um, but five is the important one, and it allows um, character uh, addressing. So you can say, I want to go to 1.1 in one the upper left-hand corner of the screen and put a character there, or I want to go to the bottom right corner of the screen and put a character there. It's just not line by line. And this is in 1970. A notable other uh, terminal system is the IBM 3270. It's, it's a later terminal system, also hugely popular, and we had all these different talks earlier on talking about mainframe systems. This is obviously still around. People are still scraping it, evidently, for uh, JSON APIs. Um, <laughs> but the uh, interesting thing about this, in contrast to the DEC, as I illustrate this as like a failure of why we are not all using IBM 3270s to write programs these days, is that it was more sophisticated at the time in that it was uh, block-oriented. So you would compose your text on the IBM 3270 in various fields, and then you would send that in mass over to uh, the mainframe. So it wasn't character-oriented where you're sending every single character. So it was more efficient in that way, in that you were doing local editing before you were submitting the field. Um, <clears throat> but it, because of its structure, it, is a, um, it, it doesn't have the same extensibility as the DEC system did. OK. so. That's the history. What is, what is the design that falls out of that um, from the DEC, from the VT100 all the way to the VT340? So the great part about it is that it's human readable. Like, and I, I, some of you might look up this and go, well, that's not human readable. What's all this garbage at the beginning and the end? 
Um, and that's sort of true, but we do see that it says systems we love, and then it has this garbage that we don't understand. Um, but that garbage is encoded still in ASCII, right? So we can read it. We don't have to, other than having to decode the bits and put them in ASCII, we don't have to do anything else to understand um, what's in front of us. And then we can um, decode it further and actually not really decode it, but this is obviously a very terse form. Um, we've separated the content, right? So we have systems we love, and then we have some information about what we're going to do with, do with that. We're going to underline it. That's the four. And then we're going to paint it in red. That's the 31. So you have just like this beginning like, of this content separated from form that has become sort of the standard of how you exchange information. Um, and then you have this very readable information. I, yes, it's terse, and you have to remember these sort of crazy escape characters and control sequence introducers. Um, but it's something that you can just read and, and write to a file and understand. And then it has this, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it has this relative intelligence. They call these the DEC VT05 and later models as being intelligent terminals. I don't really think anyone in this room would consider them intelligent, but they did allow you to tell the terminal what to do, and it would be responsible for figuring out how to do that. So in this case, I tell it to move up two lines, and then I tell it to move over 15 characters and to type 2016. And then it's also extensible. So we had that whole thing with Bob Bemmer, and he's invented the escape character, which is pretty incredible. And um, so in 1987, which is sort of like the, the apex of deck terminals, and then it's all very depressing after that, um, <laughs> he, uh, they had Sixels, Sixel and uh, Regis Graphics. And Sixel is a format for specifying in plain ASCII text um, pixel um, graphics. And so in this case, it's uh, the systems we love, Fav Icon. As in the Cisco, uh, the Cisco, Cisco format. Um, so, but pretty amazing that you have that level of extens extendability in um, the VT100 to the VT340. You can go to VT340, it's still backward compatible. You can just plug it into a Linux machine today and still do all your work. It'd just be a slightly, slightly smaller screen. Um, and then the other, this is, this is a uh, diagram from, I think, the VT100 manual. Uh, and the great thing about this is it shows, it demonstrates uh, the design that is, I think, fell out a lot from the teletype era where you have these point-to-point -point connections. Uh, they can be very long. They take a long time to transmit the data over it. So you always had this notion that the information that you were typing and the information coming back to your screen are asynchronous. And that's super important from a design perspective. It ended up being that that made it very easy for things like Telnet, which obviously comes from teletype to fall out and make not only long serial lines, but then network connections and have your terminal available wherever you want it to be. OK, so now there's the second part. So we talked a little bit about the terminal. Now there's this thing called the Unix shell. Um, so this is the Thompson shell in 1971. This is Unix v1. Um, I think it's notable in, in, in part because if you want to be immortal in the land of software, you should just name everything after yourself or your surname. That's like your only chance. Um, so this is the Thompson shell, obviously Ken Thompson. Um, and it, basically, you type in commands. It does, it does what you want it to do. But it did have IO redirection at this point. So you could take one command and direct it to a file and also both use and then subsequently use that file as input to a subsequent command, which is something any uh, Linux or Unix user does all the time. Um, then I, this was mentioned in earlier talks that uh, Douglas McIlroy um, came up with the notion of pipes. Um, so this is a memo that was circulated at IBM. Um, and he says, we should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hose, screw in an, another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. So he had this idea that we should have some way to couple all these programs together so that we could use individual components, individual programs um, to create larger programs. And uh, I think one thing that's interesting about this is that um, he has that on that second line there, right? He's like, to put my strongest concerns in a nutshell. So these are things like he really cared about them. And it's like, this is 1964, and he didn't convince Ken Thompson until 1973 to, to do it. And that's probably because like, Ken Thompson was so sick of talking to Douglas McIlroy about this problem. <laughs> And he evidently it, like, implemented the whole piping system in one night, changed all the programs to use pipes. 
Um, so I think it points to the fact that like, if you care deeply about a system and aren't thinking about it, um, you have to advocate for it or it will never happen. And then in 1979, uh, Stephen Bourne creates the, the Bourne shell, which is Turing complete. It's a full programming language um, and has all those nice properties of a programming language. So that's sort of the history. What is the design? Um, given the framework in which the shell executes as a process which spawns other processes to perform commands, the notions of I.O. redirection, background processes, command files, and other user-selectable system interfaces all become essentially trivial to implement. Um, so this is a paper by those two luminaries um, called the Unix Time Sharing System. Uh, so you break this down a little bit. So you have, um, you can perform commands as we talked about. You can do I.O. redirection, putting it into specific files, right? You have background processes, so things can run in the background. Um, you have command files, so you can take all those lists of commands, and now you have a, a, another program. You have user-selectable interfaces, which I assume means that you can just replace the Born shell with some other shell. Um, and then it has this like, great boastful thing at the end where he says they become essentially trivial to implement, which is probably only true uh, for these individuals. Um, but I think it, it, it speaks to that, like, you create this abstraction. The shell has some very nasty things that it's doing in the background to make this all possible. But once you create that abstraction, um, all these things fall out of it that are very beautiful. Um, so that's the composition piece, right? We take all these things, we compose them together, um, take some pipes, some garden hose. And then we have this, and then out of that, out of that composition, you also get just this reuse that just falls out of it, this like automatic automation. I mean, this is like anybody, any like Unix user who had, was forced to use Windows at some point, this is like why they started to cry because here you do something and then you just put it in a file and then you can do that again. In the early days of Windows, it was like, I oh, know I'd have to click 3,000 more times to figure out how to do that again. So that's an amazing power. So then so you stick those two together. So that's, those are the two systems. Um, but there's still the question of like, Where's the love, right? So this is systems we love. There should be something that I love about them. Where's the magic? Um, so the magic to me is that it's keyboard focused. It's like you're, you're using human language to try to communicate to the computer. You're typing as fast as you can type trying to communicate um, to the computer and having it communicate back to you in natural language. Um, and then this part, that, that it's it, the simplicity in um, the visual aesthetic of the terminal. Like, it's just text. It's timeless. It's a timeless median of, of humans. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it stood the time. And we have had many waves of, of visual design for computers. But text will always be with us, and it'll stay with us. And it's a, it's a focus aesthetic, too. I mean, when I'm in a single terminal without some messaging app uh, interrupting me or mail, it's like the, your only possibility to have some sort of like focused interaction with the computer and think about real problems. Um, and then it's also, it was always designed for remote access from the beginning. And then it had this piece that, this, this IO thing that started with like this teletype, you see like these commands that you're typing in and then fortunately, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson and Douglas Miller-Groy, they saw how to take that model and just continue that whole idea of input and output and bake it into Unix as a fundamental concept so that that same model of understanding input and output can be used throughout the system, which I think is great. Um, so in the end, what is it? And it is, it's like this expert tool, right? So it's one of the few, at least for me, it's the tool I use all the time. And I think in anything, if you look about expert tool use, it's one of those times where I can be using the tool and I forget that it's a tool at all, right? Like I, I'm using it and I don't, I don't have to consciously think about how I operate it. And then the amazing thing about it, in addition to being an expert tool, is it allows you to build new tools. Um, it's that creation aspect. That's the part that I love about it is creating new tools. And that's it. Thank you.